Ladies and gentlemen, can you, um, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Um, good. Uh, many of you were here last night, um, a, a fabulous evening with Claire Tomlin. Forgive me if I repeat my welcome and introduction because there are quite a few of you who are here for today. Um, it's uh, over 80 years since uh, Virginia Woolf came to Newnham at the invitation of the Newnham Arts Society, memorably had lunch in Kings with Daley Rylands, poached soul, best wine, silver service, and even more memorably, dinner in Newnham, meat to veg and a glass of water. <laughs> Um, and, of course, a room of one's own, which encapsulated that experience and all the challenges facing young women of the day became a key piece of iconography in women's writing and, of course, in the general emancipation of women. Since the 18th century, women have found an outlet for their talents through writing that was denied them in the main business of the world. Uh, and it seems to me that women have a natural sympathy, a natural interest in human relationships, which leads itself to expression through writing. So it's perhaps not surprising that Newnham has not only been groundbreaking as an educational place of excellence, but blessed amongst its alumni for the eminence of the writers nurtured here, some of the best writers of this and the last century. Somehow or other, there has been a virtuous circle between uh, education and authorship to our great delight and the inspiration of our students. Um, I thank the writers who are with us here so much. If you could have heard the students saying, I met, I met, I just met. <laughs> and it, it's terrific. And you may know that uh, currently um, our students have revived the Newnham Arts Society and have received a AHRC grant to run a magazine. I mean, it, it, it is a circle of inspiration that goes on. So we thought that we needed to create something with broader resonance out of all this. And we approached some of our writers to give to the archive, not their whole archive, but something personal, uh, manuscripts and memorabilia, photographs. And most of them have given. And that's what we're celebrating today, the foundation of an archive of women's writing at Newnham. So this weekend is a celebration of our writer's achievement and it's also, we think, the foundation for something bigger. Uh, we believe this tradition will grow to be of wider interest. I know some of you were here when Phyllis James, P.D. James, was here recently uh, and she, uh, although she's not a Newnham alumna, um, gave some of her, a manu part of the manuscript of her last novel to um, the archive. And moving to the next stage and building a broader focus on women's writing requires more than the enthusiasm of some of our senior members and the spare time of our excellent librarian and our archivist. So as you will see, we're aiming to raise £30,000 in order to employ dedicated archival effort to build this literary archive, to pay for permanent displays around the college to inspire our students and our visitors and to run further occasions like this. And with your help, I believe that this weekend, wonderful as it is, is only the beginning. We're grateful, as I said, to all our writers who have joined us, uh, particularly to those who are willing to speak. And I'd like to invite Jean Gooder, who many of you will know, and who taught and inspired so many of the Newnham writers to introduce Sarah. Jean. Does this work? It's the first time I've ever used such a thing. Is it? <laughs> All right. Well, <coughs> thank you. There is, a, of course, an extraordinary luxury in introducing somebody who needs no introduction. Everybody knows Sarah and what she has done, uh, but I'm going to give a litany, just as a, I have a purpose in doing this, as a reminder of where she comes from and how it cannot have been easy to get where she is. Begin. She was a writer a broadcaster and a critic, is, I should say. She was at Newnham at a time when she's got plenty of contemporaries amongst this starry audience today. 
Um, I've been learning a few stories of her undergraduate days. One very nice one last night uh, concerning the footlights. <laughs> that is something I think, Sarah, I'd like to come back to and pick up on. Privately, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> there are sources present. <laughs> then I think it was travel, after a spell with the BBC, but travel of a very serious and extensive kind. Japan, India, Asia, Central and South America. She was not just living there, but she was working there and learning, I think, the whole time. And one can see some of this bearing fruit. Then novels, I think in collaboration and TV series. Then on her own, launching forth. She writes three novels, I think three crime thrillers, and anybody who knows me knows that I don't do crime thrillers. Harsh APD James as well. Uh, so Sarah, I'm not even gonna to pretend to have read them, but what I do love is the titles. Uh, I'll go on to the titles of other novels. Snowstorms in a Hot Climate, Transgressions, and Mapping the Edge. They're wonderful, inviting things. Then screenplays and editing books of criti uh, critical essays. Worked on TV and radio as a <coughs> presenter and a producer. Patron of the Orange Prize for Women's Fiction. Sits on the editorial board of the Royal Academy magazine reviews for a number of our most distinguished papers. In other words, what she has done is represent the creative aspect of work and the critical aspects, the, the, what it takes to produce works of art and manage a whole world of culture. She's had her fingers in and tried out every aspect of the working life of an art person. She's going to go on now, of course, to talk about her Renaissance trilogy and the pictures that inspire some of the characters. The three titles again, but she'll get them for you. The Birth of Venus and the Company of the Courtesan and Sacred Hearts. We're going to get lots of pictures too, I believe. Uh, she's last of all been an extremely active Nunum associate, and I think we have all here, good reason to be grateful for her generosity of time, energy, and imaginative commitment there. Then I think, I just want to remind everybody of her interviewing Margaret Drabble in this very room at the alumni weekend, two years ago, nearly three. Uh, the occasion I think was an enormous success and I'm told that one guest left saying that it was the best thing he's had in the whole weekend. So the sensitivity that worked with interviews of that kind, I think is something that we're going to hear today. I thought of her, I think of her, as a totally modern person. But I think she's also, given the range of things that she is doing, a Renaissance person. So. See, and I still think of myself as 18, terrified of everybody. <laughs> so funny, isn't it? Because it's not like that, really. You just put one foot in front of the other, and by the time you reach some ghastly, august age, it appears that you have a career behind you. But it's <laughs> never how it feels when you're doing it. Anyway, um, uh, it is, of course, an extraordinary moment to be here. And little did I think when I was walking those endless corridors <laughs> of Newnham or sitting in that library with my head in a tome about Carolingian history <laughs> that I would ever come back as a published novelist to celebrate such an extraordinary moment as the opening of the Newnham Literary Archive. And it's perhaps all the more fitting because the three novels I'm going to talk about partly take their inspiration from women's stamina and women's creativity through history. Eighteen months ago, I was asked to write by the National Portrait Gallery an essay about the relationship between the novelist and the portrait artist. 
And it was a great challenge because it made me think a great deal about how far artists throughout history, especially those who paint portraits, have in many ways been doing the work before the novelist of the novelist and afterwards in conjunction with that, creating character, creating place, creating story. So I'm going to play on that idea this morning as a way of getting into history, which I also think as befits where we're sitting today, is also her story as well. So, as a novelist, my business is words. With words, I create worlds, I paint pictures, I draw characters, I give those characters depth and shade, I explore colour and darkness in the worlds I live in. When I use such terms, paint pictures, draw characters, light and shade, colour and darkness, I am aware, as you will be too, that they might easily be words applicable to being an artist. <laughs> Clearly, the painter and the writer have many similarities. We both offer you beauty or provoke disgust. We can both make you feel. We can make you think. We can be personal. We can be political. We can challenge. We hope to move you. And at the heart of this is our ability to get under the skin, equally a phrase that we would both use. At one level, of course, it's almost a forensic job. Any painter of the human form must be fluent in two kinds of penetration. One is to the bone, i.e. literally the ability to understand the human form inside as well as out. This doesn't mean that artists today need to be anatomists, although of course that was profoundly important to the period of time I'm talking about, and we'll discuss that a bit later. But it does mean that at one point in its history, art and portraiture had a very passionate relationship with dissection in order to get where it's got to today. The second penetration, of course, is psychological to suggest character as well as form. And it's a very tall order to do both. For the novelist, at one level, it's different. Because while you could argue that we do put dots of paint onto a canvas in terms of description, I think one of the great things about novels is that it's actually your imagination that paints the pictures in your own head. And because every imagination is different, every scene and character that we create will be subtly different for each reader. I think, actually, surely that's why it's sometimes so hard when a book you really love is put onto the screen. Because on one hand, nine or time, ten times out of time, the character will not be the one that you yourself had imagined. It's almost as if they're doing a disservice to the work because you had made the film in your own head before somebody else made it. So, on the other hand, what we share with the painter is that at the same time as we use words to build up characters, we also use words to strip them away, to look underneath the surface at what is going on underneath. It's taken me the best part of ten years to write this trilogy of novels about the Renaissance, um, and they were a very conscious attempt to create a sort of living, breathing experience of one of this most complex and richest periods of European history, the Italian Renaissance. The idea was born in the year 2000, when for all kinds of reasons my life was in a complete mess. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to write next, and my personal life was also in deep trouble. And I bring this up now, not to gain your sympathy, but because I think that in an era where everybody stresses how wonderful things are now for women, and how it is absolutely possible for them to achieve anything, I have come to believe, both as a feminist and a mother of two daughters, that sometimes those, overwhelming, those expectations can be overwhelming. And that very ironically, it is how people deal with failure and disappointment that makes them who they are in life as much as they deal with success. And as probably every single one of us in this room will know, failure in some shape or form will come to all of us. So actually, it was as a roundedly educated Newnham graduate that I found myself failing, right? Or as Dante would suggest, halfway through my life, I lost myself in the middle of a dark wood. Very luckily for me, the middle of the dark wood also took place in Florence. Highly recommended. If you're <laughs> right? 